Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking edition of The Matt Brown Show. And this is the Built in Texas series, where we're going to be talking about psychedelics, baby. Yeah. So super pumped to get into this. This is a conversation I think more of us need to have. And I couldn't imagine having uh, this conversation with anyone more knowledgeable uh, and innovative in the space of next generation biotech solutions. Uh, his name is Chad Harmon. He is the founder and CEO of Psychsudical, psychsudical.com. Uh, for those of you who want to learn more, so Chad, welcome to the show, bro. Thanks, man. I appreciate you having me on today, man. Dude, so you've got a, a cool background. I mean, the least of which is you're a former vet, but uh, you've been doing a lot of different things over the years. And I'd love for you to kick our, uh, kick things off for us uh, and for our viewers around the world, uh, Chad, who haven't heard about you and kind of like what you've been up to. And then if you would uh, just paint a picture for us of the origin story of Psychceutical and how this whole thing actually came about. Sure, sounds great. Yeah, a bit about my, you know, my background leading up to today. I spent two decades in the health insurance industry with the second uh, largest uh, health insurer out there. Uh, really shaped and molded you know, my leadership, business, and technical skills. I had the pleasure of building multiple you know, high-performing teams across various departments. Uh, so those operations, IT, finance, sales, and marketing, uh, highlighted by winning multiple company awards for my team's efforts. So I uh, had a great long career there. Uh, and you know, But really what left an indelible impression on me, Matt, was a, was really you know, kind of really the driving force of where I'm at today is early on during my customer service career was speaking to the customers and, and hearing the desperation and overwhelming emotions uh, when they were dealing with you know life-changing conditions um, e even some of the family members that called in I remember distinctly and just just hearing that emotion you know when when they or their loved ones got cancer Alzheimer stroke dementia various addiction or, you know, mental health disorders. And I remember thinking and realizing almost three, three decades ago, we had very few, if any, solutions to these very debilitating conditions. Now, fast forward today, um, you know, we've made very little progress in these areas. And so this had a very profound effect on me. And during the latter stage of my career, I felt this overwhelming uh, feeling that I had to be involved in finding solutions for these massive healthcare challenges. You know, Matt, I was seeing the, the data day in and day out, and uh, we, we were actually, you know, driving healthcare results uh, down. And so, you know, at that time, it was really hard, hard to fathom with all the rapid accumulated knowledge and technology advancements we've seen over the past few decades at that time. I knew there had to be alternative solutions out there. And uh, you know, as fate had had it, uh, I lived in Colorado at the time. And during that time, uh, cannabis became legal. So I would have understood, you know, growing up and, and uh, really had this, you know, stigmatized uh, you know, background about cannabis. So it was more of the propaganda, but I really kept an open mind about it. Began reading studies, people were successfully treating various conditions and ailments without the need for, you know, traditional pharmaceutical products. Um, then, then I started hearing friends of mine uh, who were dropping their medications and having, you know, personal success. So that for me was was very uh, profound, and and this is really an aha moment for me, and found an opportunity to transition from my corporate career in 2015, where I was engaged as a consultant um, to a vertically integrated uh, cannabis company, where I acted as a co-CEO, and I helped them define their business strategy, uh, develop processes and procedures, raise some capital for them, uh, which ultimately led to a successful exit years later. I uh, continued on into the cannabis industry uh, where I, I met my, uh, what, what is now my co-founder, Dave Mahalik. Uh, he's the CEO of Coeptis Pharmaceuticals. And, um, you know, he had been tracking the emerging psychedelic industries for the better part of two years and seeing the, the tremendous results with, you know, the, the ongoing clinical trials. And, um, you know, at, and I was looking at it and I said, this, this is, uh, they're taking a different approach to um, uh, than cannabis. Uh, I always wanted to see cannabis, uh, you know, really go into the pharmaceutical route because I think there was a, a lot of opportunity to create, you know, various, um, very targeted products for, for specific indications and put the structure and rigor of delivering them, you know, in a very safe and effective format. Um, so for me, it was, it was exciting to see that he had tracked that 
and to see those results, you know, we decided, you know, we wanted to, um, you know, really partner up uh, with his pharmaceutical drug development experience and my uh, psychedelic experience in cannabis. So we formed uh, Psychoceutical back in uh, December of 2020. Very, very cool, man. It's interesting how you kind of came around, you know what I mean? Like when you started getting into the benefits of cannabis, which I think is the kind of standard story for most people. So for instance, if you don't understand, like if I said at the top end of the show, I was like, yeah, we're going to talk about psychedelics, baby. And people are like, oh shit, this guy's going to be too, like, yeah. you know what I mean? Like LSD is bad and like the hippies and this and that. And like, you know, and I, and, and I can't remember where I watched it, but like, I think there's so much uh, innovation at a product level, but also like research and development that's happening with the application of these modern day uh, treatments to massive systemic issues, which is ultimately is about mental health. Um, and uh, I think it was on Joe Rogan's show, like um, I think it was like Paul Stemmett or something like that. He's like huh? with the fungi guy, like with the mushrooms and things like that. Yeah. Also a psychedelic psilocybin in Colorado, you know this, um, but they're going to be, uh, well, it's likely that they will be legalizing psilocybin also over and above marijuana soon. Um, and in states of like, there's a big decriminalization trend. So it seems to me like there's a lot of, regu you know, things that are opening up that where systems and ecosystems were previously closed and taboo. Now suddenly it's top of mind conversation going, you're like, well, you know, what are the applications? What could the benefits be? Um, because, you know, if you're coming back from, uh, from a war zone and you've got, you know, PTSD, you don't want to be dropping like benzos, you know what I mean? To, to cope right. with that shit. And, and if there's a more natural, um, uh, approach to resolving and treating some, uh, mental diseases, um, then, you know, then I think as a society we'll be better off. And, and my sense is, I don't know how you feel about it, Chad, but, my sense is, is that we should be more open uh, than what we are as a society. You know what I mean? It is changing, but I think there's still a lot of work uh, to do. What are, you, what are your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, what we've uncovered certainly the last couple of years is that um, research and, and clinical uh, studies have shown that, you know, the, the traditional treatment models just d d flat out don't work, right? You're, you're talking, you know, since the advent of the SSRIs in the 80s and, uh, and, and just the poor and lack of uh, real therapeutic benefits to uh, SSRIs. And then you consider, you know, often many, many years or decades worth of, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy and psych therapy. I mean, it's just shown that it, it's, it's a long drawn out process. People are suffering today and, and quite honestly, you know, coming out of this pandemic, I mean, uh, we're, we're seeing, you know, the rates jump off the charts, you know, we, you know, some of the stats say one in five Americans are afflicted with some type of mental health disorder. But um, one of our, um, one of our, uh, our chief medical officer, uh, Dr. Julian Bales, he's a neurosurgeon. He's, um, you know, he was worked with the NFL and he's, he's on the board of the NCAA. And he's saying, Chad, in the NCAA and these student athletes in the NFL, we're, we're seeing one in three. Um, you know, student athletes and individuals um, afflicted with some sort of, of mental uh, disorder, and certainly it's amplified coming out of um, uh, coming out of uh, the pandemic. But also, to your point, now we've got the Ukraine war. We've had multiple wars over the past few decades. So our veterans are coming home, and they don't know how to cope, and they don't have a deal. Um, mm. and, and you know, the suicide rates. We all know the stats. I mean, it was twenty something veterans a day are killing themselves. And, and so we, we just, we've um, allowed, you know, again, I come from the health insurance. So I saw the data and the stats, uh, Matt. So it, it's, it's, they say 30% effective rates. rates. I, I say it's even lower than that. So we, we knew we had to do something and pharma was not uh, bringing forth any solutions and the medical side wasn't. So uh, for me, this was an easy, easy decision based on a lot of those uh, clin early clinical results that this psychedelic medicine has great promise um, to yeah, to It does. And we were, I, need, I really want to get into that because I'm curious just for my information anyway. I don't care if you guys are listening. <laughs> uh, but um, just some of the stats though, just to paint a picture here of the problem here. So um, this is according to CDC.gov. So we all know who they are. Uh, more than 50% of uh, people in the United States 
uh, will be diagnosed with a mental il illness or disorder at some point in their lifetime. I know I've suffered from depression. Uh, one in five Americans will experience a mental illness this year. One in five children, either currently or at some point during their life, have had seriously debilitating mental illness, hence the opioid uh, epidemic, I'm sure. Uh, one in 25 Americans lives with a ser today, currently, lives with a serious mental illness, such as schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, or major depression. Like, these numbers really do paint a picture of, like, how massive this issue is. And I think there's, there's so much, like, taboo around it. Do you know what I mean? Like, no one wants to put their hand up and go, yo, like, I suffer from depression. Do you know what I mean? Right. And it's... And Especially it's, men, right? Oh, my God, please. What, like, can we please get over ourselves and just say, yo, I'm, I'm fucked up. You know, we all fucked up, like, at some point. Like, no one's a, you know, a Van Gogh art piece. You know, we all have issues. Um, and the sooner we, to your point, Chad, the sooner we admit that we have a problem, the sooner we can start to fix it, you know? And it's so it's so interesting, like with teenagers, like they don't want to go to, to, to their parents, you know, especially young men. Like they don't want to go to their mom when they're listen, like I, I, I'm in trouble, you know? Like I'm not, I'm not coping. Like I spoke to um, one of my clients out in California um, and uh, she's the CEO of Dynam. And she was saying to me, um, Diana, and she was saying like her kids are at, you know, going to college. And then she uh, says, oh, yeah, like how, that's exciting. And she goes, yeah, and, you know, and there's like they're really suffering from anxiety. You know what I mean? Like, and right. like as in like she knows about it, you know, and it's just like, it's so sad. Like how did we create a society that creates overwhelming anxiety in, in teenagers? And then you've got like Instagram. You know what I mean? Where the perfect thought is and everyone's life is amazing, isn't it? And how shit is your life? Wouldn't right. it be great if we all lived our own Instagram timelines or Facebook timelines? So um, so it is a problem that that is huge. What? How big is it though? Like if you were to put a dollar value on the opportunity that you guys are going after as psychoceutical um, in dollars, what is what would you say is the, the market opportunity right now? Yeah, it's massive. I mean, it's a 400 billion... A year problem that we have on our hands, Matt. I mean, it, it's 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 massive, and um, and and and, I, and what I would say though, Matt, and here's what people don't realize, is that uh, one one of my uh, medical advisory board members is Dr. Thomas Cabell, and he's a cardiologist, and and him and our other medical advisory board members will say say the same thing. Um, a lot of uh, you know cardiac issues and other disease state issues are uh, attributed to in, in most cases to mental health conditions whether it be depression anxiety um it creates a sleeplessness right it, those are all um those are all areas of concern for these doctors and they're saying look i'm 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 seeing patients that have long history of anxiety depression and then i know that by the time they're hitting 40 and certainly in 50, that that's going to lead to a cardiac uh, cardiac issue. And so there's a lot of uh, comorbidities directly linked with, with mental health disorders. So when we talk about a $400 billion opportunity, it's much larger than that because of all the other um, attributed uh, side effects from, you know, longstanding mental health disorders that go untreated. So you know, and that and that's that's something that people just don't understand. And we even talk about longevity, right? We want those anti-aging, but it really comes down to you know having self-care and and having solutions that, that you know people can uh, seek relief. Well, um, let's get into what's actually happening then on the ground. So, what would you say are in terms of the research? So, uh, there's obviously uh, Zappi uh, Zeppelin, who's like quite at the forefront of this space, um, and he was basically saying recently that like science continues to produce some interesting and remarkable research, and that society is starting to come around to the applications of this. So, so maybe. So there's two things here I want to get into. The first thing is, what have you guys built or created uh, in terms of uh, application of uh, of uh, treatments using uh, psychedelics? Um, and then, what is the re in terms of like the latest research? What's actually being discovered around the application of a product such as yourself, or in such as the one that you developed? Um, sure. Yeah. So. Uh few few items there but 
what I would say is that again, you know, decades of research have shown that psychedelic medicines have powerful potential for life-saving mental health treatment. There, there's no doubt about that. So we can we can you know put that aside. Um, but you know what what the, the challenge has been, and I really really would like to um, to to call this out is you know for for the widespread adoption of it, you know these these powerful medicines and profound medicines they need to be delivered in the same way the pharmaceuticals do. You know with very precision targeted control. So at Psychoceutical, we are a you know biopharmaceutical company, so we're we're bringing a much needed focus on the precision dosing technology, which has been missing. Um, not only, you know, in the pharma field in itself, but, you know, certainly in the psychedelic field, because we've got a big stigma to overcome. Um, so our mission is to develop, you know, safer and more effective tools for combating the mental health and addiction crises. And what we're seeing, though, even beyond the mental health and addiction areas of disease states, we're now starting to see, you know, neurological disorders come into the purview of where these psychedelic medicines can target and control. Um, so the, the first product that we're, we're um, in uh, clinical trials, we'll be going into uh, clinical trials, is uh, we're, we're targeting ketamine, uh, which is a uh, typically used as an anesthetic, but uh, and, and was created uh, out of the University of, of Michigan back in the 60s. Uh, consequently, one of our uh, licensed technologies, the Janus particle technology, uh, was licensed out of the University of Michigan, so kind of a full circle there. Very, very cool to to uh, have that uh, part of uh, that story. Uh, but we're we're using one of our tech, other technologies, the NeuroDirect. Um, but basically, it, it bypasses the traditional systemic or oral solution, where it's going to the circulatory system, meaning that's going to the the, the liver and the kidneys, and there's a lot of uh, potential side effects. And um, as we know, with psychedelics, you're dealing with hallucinations, you're dealing with uh, lethargy, sometimes vomiting. Um, so there's a lot of uh, you know side effects to contend with, and that's one of the barriers to entry in this industry. And so you know that's why we, when we started this company, Matt, we wanted something that was going to uh, one alleviate a lot of those concerns to create that user adoption and certainly get these onto the market. Um, but also, you know, from an, you know, wearing my insurance hat, you know, we need to think about the overall cost of care. And if we think about the way psychedelic drugs are traditionally administered, you're talking, you know, an hour or four or five, or sometimes in, in some rare cases, you know, 12 hour experiences, which can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. And so uh, insurance companies are not going to reimburse for that type of model. So, you know, we, we, we truly wanted to have these delivery technologies. Uh, so one, we can get to the to commercialize them much quicker than potentially our competitors, but also we wanted to create a, a, a wider adoption. So, you know, think about the adolescents who would not want a, uh, a psychedelic experience or those in the senior population, or those again, that just are very opposed to having any psychedelic experience. So we, we wanted to take that approach. Um, and so our first drug that, that we're going to be bringing to market or going through clinical trials is ketamine, using the neurodirect ketamine. And uh, uh, what I will say about that, uh, it was created by Dr. Ronald Ongden. He's a neuropsychiatrist and neurologist out of Sarasota, Florida. And I had the pleasure of meeting him in the cannabis industry and ended up licensing his technology for psychoceutical. But was, what was really more remarkable is that he can take any neuroaffective compound like cannabis or psychedelics, and you can apply it in a topical cream format right at the back of the neck of the hairline or the C3, C4. And there's an it, almost immediate, when I say almost immediate, within seven to 10 minutes, the, the patient starts to feel the effect of the, the compound that's being delivered. In this case, it's ketamine. And so uh, he's able to use the, the current um, ketamine in that format at his practice today. So he has seen over, well over 300 patients, Matt, with uh, severe PTSD disorders. Many of them have been on you know, decades long um, uh, treatment, whether you know, SSRIs, uh, benzos, or cognitive behavioral therapy, and they've just not responded. And so these are the worst of the worst. And so he has 
had over 300 patients run through this with an 85 percent success rate and response rate that that is very profound so we had the luxury in, in typically matt in drug development you have to go through um you know a lot of preclinical laboratory testing and then you do it in animal models and then and then once you get through that then you have to go into human and we had the luxury here because ketamine is an approved schedule three drug um so it is approved and then with Dr. Ongden's medical license, he's able to apply it in an off-label format. So we had, you know, the, the ability to get some of that data to support our first product. And so this is, again, going to be for PTSD patients, which is skyrocketed. Again, think about our, our veterans coming back from war or who've been to war that, that are, are continuing to suffer. Um, and, and it's just a, a amazing, th those results that so... Uh, we're launching our first clinical trials, our uh, phase one and phase two, in Australia of uh, next year, in mid, uh, middle of next year. And we're very excited to, to, to launch that. And uh, certainly in phase three, hopefully in the next, you know, 16 to 24 months, we'll, we'll start that here in the United States and, and abroad. So, uh, again, uh, PTSD is a $20 billion a year market opportunity. Globally, it's much bigger than that. Uh, but what the great news here is um, that is that as we go through this first one, we can start to add other indications like anxiety and depression. So, you know, those are, again, are, 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 are massive markets that we can tackle as well. Mm. And uh, you guys have raised uh, $7 million to date, give or take. Um, and so obviously this isn't just a pipe dream. This is something that's actually going to come down the pipeline. I actually think your timing's really interesting, given what I was saying earlier around like, decriminalization around this stuff and the amount of research is coming out and how society is starting to go, yo, you know, if we can help people who are suffering mentally, like, you know, let's, let's give it a go. Um, but uh, I'm curious to understand, how do you guys make money then? I know you have a dual revenue model, but I'd love for you to share, because a lot of investors listen to the show too. Like how, how does the revenue generating piece, let's say like the trials are done, what have you, like, how do you see your commercials playing out? Yeah, it's a great question. So we, you know, we are an OTC pink company under BWBI. We're just going through our um, name and symbol change with Finner right now. So hopefully we'll get that updated to uh, psychoceutical uh, bioscience and uh, get that uh, ticker symbol updated uh, because the really the next step in the evolution of the company is to be a you know publicly um, on on a major exchange like Nasdaq or quite honestly we're seeing biotech co companies taking. Uh, the approach of uh, New York Stock Exchange, which uh, NASDAQ has had, had a hold on that. So <clears throat> that's really the next step in the evolution of the process. But you know how we how do we generate revenue and value for investors is again, biotech is is really predicated on 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 future valuation, what you're building as a company. So again, going back to what traditional pharmaceutical companies, how they drive revenue is early stage clinical results. So when you start filing an IND, which is really your opening studies to, you know, start the preclinical work with animal studies, and then, you know, going on to phase one, two, and three uh, within uh, the clinical trial. So each one of those uh, inflection points, the IND, the, the preclinical great results, the phase one great results each, each uh, positive news result will start to increase the valuation of the, uh, uh, for, for investors. So, you know, you can see significant bumps because of the forward progress you're making uh, in the drug development. So again, what, what going back to some of those challenges in the psychedelic realm, again, commercialization and cost of care model, um, the insurance is something that, that a lot of companies that I felt in the industry were not looking at. Um, because of the cost of care model. And, and again, going back to why we really chose the, the uh, technologies is to really bypass a lot of those, those side effects. And so for us, we know we can't do everything, in, 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 but we can go out and do co-development deals with, our, with other companies and license out the technology uh, to you know, competitor companies when it makes sense. Uh, so we can, you know, inure the benefit of, of having a very robust drug development pipeline where investors can, you know, reap the rewards and benefits of that. So what we would be doing 
uh, Matt, is is taking these up to phase two, phase three, getting very positive results, and then look to partner uh, with a much larger pharmaceutical company, you know, like the Eli Lilly's of the world, the Johnson and Johnson's, the Merck's, um, Pfizer, you, you name it. So uh, we would then sell off uh, and basically have a license, uh, licensing and royalty deal where they give you a, a great upfront sum of money and then trailing royalty. So uh, we want to get as many of those drugs in the, in the development pipeline. So for us, uh, building out that pipeline and working with our competitors is something that you know we're we're starting to do now and 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 look to you know create you know multiple revenue streams from that. Mm. Yep, it's an exciting um, it's an exciting time, isn't it, um, for what you guys are doing? Um, so I, I've like I've played around with substances, obviously. Yeah, you <laughs> like you haven't lived if you if you haven't. Um, um, and I've you know done ketamine before knowingly or unknowingly i'm sure <laughs> um curious though why ketamine and not something like psilocybin yeah to... that's a great question and so uh, again it goes back to the drug development strategy as a company um we had two you know benefiting factors again going back to our technology um, we, we chose ketamine because it is a, is a schedule three drug. So when you consider other substances like MDMA, psilocybin, psilocybin, um, ibogaine, uh, LSD, you're dealing with DMT, you're dealing with substances that are on, on a schedule one. So there's a, there's a, a larger barrier to entry, uh, to, for those drugs. So there's a, a longer time horizon to commercialization with uh, ketamine. Uh, for the, in, in especially in the topical format that we're going after, it's what's considered a 505B2. So it's a faster path to, uh, to you know, marketing the product and getting it through and approved. So for us, it was, you know, all those factors uh, and giving, and, and given the fact that Dr. Ongden had seen such great early results with his patient population, it was just a great uh, opportunity to get something that would give us a great early win for the company. Um, but also just ketamine in, in general, uh, we, we uh, Zappy and I really call it, it's, it's very similar to like the limitless drug. Uh, it's a very profound compound. And, and uh, what people, if you ever looked at it, like a, a functional MRI of all the different psychedelics, you will see that, uh, Ketamine in general will light up both hemispheres of the brain. And within, uh, once it starts to metabolize, uh, Matt, you're creating new, what they consider new dendritic connections or neuro, new neural connections. And you're starting to see offshoots of that immediately. And it starts to metabolize and you're still uh, reaping those benefits up to seven days afterwards. So you're starting to, uh, one, with ketamine, very profound where you're creating um, those, those connections uh, where, uh, again, we know that through repetition and habits that we've, creating, we've created our own neural network. And through, through, you know, through again, through those habits or even in many, many instances where we've had a traumatic experience in our life or we've had this you know, major fear episode, um, you know, we're, we're by, bypassing some of those, um, those neuroreceptors. And so ketamine, uh, it's so profound that it, it'll reconnect and it'll relax those receptor sites where the habits have been formed so that you're able to, you know, create and renew those connections. So it, it is a truly remarkable compound. And as we know, with the clinical results, depression, anxiety, and many other disorders have the high propensity to overcome them very quickly with ketamine. So, you know, it, it was just a, a perfect storm for us. Uh, certainly other uh, compounds like uh, psilocybin, uh, LSD, uh, and uh, ibogaine uh, are, are on our radar. And, and we have uh, definitely have a commercialization strategy and a pipeline to, to look at those as well. Cool. So this is a space I'm imagining is going to... Uh more people were trying to get into it, you know, um, founders and that kind of thing. And I'm curious to, I mean, I don't know the space anywhere near as well as you do, but I'm curious to understand like from, from a journey perspective, uh, 
what would you say has been your greatest failure, quote unquote, um, you know, on this journey to date? And, and, and what did you learn from that? Yeah, greatest failure. You know, the when I, again, going back to my two decades of, uh, of uh, corporate life, right, you, you, you get uh, a very comfortable and you have a certain lifestyle and you've got that safety net there. So uh, that was quite the transition for me, you, you know, even though that, um, and, and, I, and I told this to my wife when we made that transition, it, 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 and at that time, you know, really felt like if I was not growing, which I, I felt I was not at the time, I was dying inside because I always had this tremendous aptitude to learn more and to outperform everybody. And uh, I just, I, I, I was a, a fierce competitor. And so when I reached that point, I said, I've got to do something. This doesn't make sense. And so, you know, I went out and I did some consulting work. I started my own after I had that consulting uh, gig that uh, uh, turned out very, very well uh, for all parties involved and then started my own. Uh, you know, some of the failures were uh, in, in Colorado in particular, seeing that uh, we had such a, a tremendous upside in cannabis and we were seeing market pricing going through the roof and the opportunity was just so great. But what we didn't realize and where I failed is to recognize that at some point in the market, there was going to be this, this market um, uh, basically resettling of the market uh, you know, into more of a commodities-based business like every business has. You'll everybody, it'll be novel. And then at some point you bring in enough market competition, it's going to drive uh, the pricing down. Uh, so uh, you can beat your competitor. And so we saw that major market shift where uh, the, the market prices started to, to, to really bottom out. And it became very difficult to you know, own, own and operate a business in, in the cannabis space, as well as um, you know, the, the whole marketing aspect and the regulatory challenges you have because you can't traditionally market and uh, sell your product uh, like, like a nutraceutical would today. There's a lot of restrictions in cannabis and where you, where you can and cannot market. So you know, that was one of my, my failures is to recognize the, the market opportunity and um, you know, just where the, the, the market was going. And then also we started to see many of the, the individuals that were coming to, and these were visitors that were coming to Colorado and driving you know, the, the market uh, as more states started to open up. That means more of those out of state individuals were now staying at home and enjoying cannabis in their own state. So those were a lot of the lessons that I learned uh, just from a market perspective and business. Um, and so, yeah, I, I would say that would be, you know, my biggest, biggest failure. Okay. Good one. Um, so raising money, I've touched on this, you raised 7 million odd <clears throat> to date. Like what, are, what's the average investors, you know, when you go, Hey, we want to do, uh, you know, a, a microdosing delivery solution, delivering ketamine and whatever it might be. <clears throat> what is the, What's the attitude to or from an investor's perspective in this particular context like are they bullish on it is it a hard sell what's the what's the experience been like for you yeah it, it's it's uh and it's been it's been great uh, for the most part because again we're dealing with uh something that's shown you know great clinical result results early on to overcome these you know, these very um, debilitating uh, mental health disorders. So people are recognizing that and seeing it. Um, but what we've heard and what we've seen from some of the investors, you know, some of the hesitancy, and this is again, some of the bleed over from cannabis. Again, I, I, I was one of the early individuals there to see you know, a lot of these uh, companies that, that were started and they did drug development and um, they didn't really have the team and the technologies to differentiate themselves. And that was, uh, and, and so investors really took a page out of cannabis and say, you guys have to really have something. Uh, one, you have to have a market differentiator, uh, know that you're gonna be there for the long haul. Um, do, you have a, do you have a team that can, that can execute? And then for us, uh, which has been uh, phenomenal, is having a, a marketing 
and a mouthpiece like Zappy Zappelin has been for us. Uh, he's already been out in the forefront of this industry. He, he did a couple of movies, um, Reality of Truth with uh, Michelle Rodriguez, um, that had a lot of uh, great press. And he was able to walk her through a very difficult time after the loss of her you know, co-star and, and great friend, Paul Walker. And then most recently, uh, we all heard about Lamar Odom's story, you know, at the Bunny Ranch and the multiple strokes and almost dying. And, uh, you know, he, uh, uh, you know, his best friend called Zappy during one of his premiere, The Reality of Truth, and said, hey, you know, Lamar Odom is my friend. He is, um, you know, he, he's, he's, not, he's not in a good place. I think we're going to lose him. We need to do something drastic. And so, you know, Zappy took him on the journey. And uh, Lamar has been a big advocate since then and has been clean and sober. As a matter of fact, he, he, he didn't think he was ever going to walk again and uh, uh, thought he would be very debilitated mentally as well. And with the ketamine treatment, other, other uh, plant-based med med uh, medicines on top of it have, have uh, created a newer version, newer and better version of Lamar Odom today. Um, so that has given us a, a lot of credibility in terms of us knowing these compounds very intimately with the team that we have. Um, and then with the, again, the, the, the hundreds of years of uh, you know, experience on the team of drug development veterans, um, medical doctors that are world renowned, like I said, Dr. Julian Bales, who's world, world foremost expert and a neurosurgeon. Uh, he was the subject matter of uh, concussion, the movie with Will Smith and Alec Baldwin played him. Um, but he did a lot of early stage re uh, research and advocacy for the NFL um, for patients with, um, you know, CTE uh, for mm -hmm. players. And so if anybody knows the brain, it's going to be Dr. Uh, Dr. Bales. And then, you know, we have a, um, a neuroscientist, Dr. Ark Logston. And where science is taking us is, again, we need new ways to deliver, uh, you know, these compounds or any neurological neuroeffective compound, very targeted. And so what our team is really focused on uh, is delivering uh, compounds across the blood-brain barrier, uh, Matt, because we, we, we want to target to the direct receptor uh, site in the brain. So we're not, again, um, having all the associated side effects. Uh, and we want to deliver just a minimal amount of the drug. So, you know, that's our mission is to, you know, create set, safe and effective um, uh, medicines, but also too, if you think about the life cycle of pharmaceutical kind of generations, right? You have kind of generation one that's getting the, the compound through the, through the clinical trial um, pathway. And then what will happen is then you'll create a, a new way of delivering it. So if you're doing an oral so solution, maybe you're doing an intranasal for faster delivery. Um, uh, you know, things like that, or an IV uh, in some cases. So a new delivery to, to, to create more IP. And so what we did is we went right for the delivery technology because we wanted to be, you know, differentiated. We wanted uh, patients to have that precision targeted control immediately and not have to wait years upon years. So that's where we really de differentiated ourselves. And, and, I, and again, when you talk to investors, Matt, and you know this better than anybody, is that with what little money you raise, you have to show and prove to them that you can execute and you can, you can build value off, off the, the early stage money that, um, that, that, you know, that you, you raised. So we've been able to you know, have a, a very nice valuation and we've done a lot of great um, work you know, building a great drug development pipeline to date uh, with the with the money that we have, and certainly in the next capital raise uh, next month, uh, will will certainly get us to that full drug development pipeline and are on our way up to to Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. Why the public markets? <clears throat> That's so interesting. Like, um, there's so well. One observation is, <laughs> I told this to you, but like um, most of the med tech biopharma guys that I've had on the show are for some reason there's an over index in Texas. Like, why <laughs> is that a case? Um, and, um, and I'm also curious to, 
Well, one of the other observations is, is like if you're doing med tech, biopharma, something like that, like most of the founders choose to, Biotricity was another one, Rakaz, like is choose the public markets, go to the NASDAQ. Um, and then, of course, there, there is obviously the private uh, private investment markets too, but um, it seems to me like most of them choose the public markets to, to do this, to fund this type of venture. Um, do you see that as there being an issue with that, given society's current perspective on psychedelics in general, like drugs bad, you know what I mean? So I'm not going to public, you know, put my money on a, do you know what I'm trying to say? Like public markets, perception, they kind of go together. Do you see that as being an issue or, or do you feel like investors are astute enough to recognize the value of what you're doing? Yeah, I mean, we, we've had a track record in the bi biotech industry that, you know, to, in order to, again, there, there's a lot of inherent risk, right, that we take on as, as a biotech or a pharmaceutical company, right? I mean, we could have, you know, several failures, right? So that's why we try to develop a, a very robust uh, drug development pipeline where you've got, you know, a few very safe bets uh, that, we, 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 that we think are safe. Uh, based on the analysis, and then you you create uh, you know another you know high value you know high risk type of target uh, as well, and that's that's really what these investors want to see is that you've got a really robust pipeline, and and again these these the the drug development is is not cheap. It, it is very expensive from animal studies to uh, to you know, human studies. Uh, it, it, it's very costly, and so. To, to get the type of investment that uh, you need to support uh, an early stage biotech company, you really need to go to the public markets because one, uh, investors do want to see that transparency of where the dollars are going. And so they want to have you know, finan financial audit reports. Uh, they want constant news out to help support the stock. So uh, there's that, that public market pressure that you just don't have Invisibility in, in terms of the finances that you just don't have with a private company, and so you know that's where um, this industry is well suited, and investors know the inherent risk uh, and and understand that the tremendous up, upside uh, of of you know getting these drugs through the the clinical trial. Mm -hmm. So I want to have a quick bit of fun with you, um, and then uh, we'll wrap up. Okay. Um, so I'd love to give you the keys to the uh, Map Round Show time machine and ask you to go back to yourself on day one. If you think about everything you've been through, what advice would you give yourself about building Psychceutical? It's a, it's a great question. And uh, I, I would say, uh, and this is what we've done you know, extremely well now, is... Uh, you know, and I learned this from from my early days in, in corporate. I, I always uh, I, I always brought on you know very uh, astute, hungry, uh, well educated um, individuals that that fit certain needs within the team, and so uh, that was always my my strength in coaching people up and motivating them. And what I would say is that. Uh, I would have hired a few more consultants, the ones that we have now. Uh, matter of fact, earlier uh, than, than than later, uh, because they would have cut off some of that 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 uh, drug development time. Even though I think we've done an amazing, tremendous job of getting where where we are at today, and really, literally, a, a year's time, Matt. I mean, we're going right in next year, phase one and phase two in humans, and that's. That's lightning speed for this industry, but I, I would have, I would have, um, I would have hired those those advisors earlier, and given me feedback on that direction um, sooner rather than later. Um, you know, and and I think the other the other area that that I would have um, really honed in and focused on is getting uh, more press and getting the team out there uh, sooner rather than later. I know we did a great job there too, but uh, I think there were some missed opportunities on where we could have gotten some more brand exposure and and really been at some of those uh, key stakeholder um, uh, panels uh, across various industry um, uh, you know uh, symposiums, if you will. So so those were certainly the two the two that that I I would say if I would have gone back in time I would have done a little bit different.
Yeah. Wouldn't it be nice if we could just do that? Yeah. Yes. God damn. We'd make way more, way fewer mistakes, but it would take the growing out of it. So, yes. but look, um, Chad, I think, you know, I love what you guys are doing. I, I think you, you know, at the forefront of it, it's such a, it's up for grabs. It's a white space. And so those of you who, you know, of those of us who believe in, in the space and its applications in the real world, and uh, when, you know, when markets turn and, and society starts to wake up, which is happening, you know, and That's regulators awesome. start to go, yeah, okay, cool. It's fine. You know, we'll get over ourselves, you know, 50 years of hurt. It's time to stop. Um, uh, you know, it's going it, to, there's a huge opportunity on the table and I really do wish you and the team all the very best of success. Uh, thank you, Matt. And, and what I want to leave the readers with or your viewers with as well is that, you know, some of the results we've, we've talked a lot through the conversation today about mental health disorders. You know, obviously we're going after PTSD. We're, we're going to be going after addiction, which we hold a lot of promise in our solution there. <clears throat> but the other areas that I do want to talk about uh, just quickly is that, you know, we're, we're still trying to understand truly how these profound, remarkable compounds work in the body. Um, we're still starting to scratch the surface. But w what we are seeing as of, as of recent is looking at other neurological disorders like Parkinson's, Alzheimer, dementia, um, traumatic brain injury, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, even in some cases, we saw an, an Apple put out a great article on um, uh, paraplegic individual where these compounds are now having tremendous multiple sclerosis. Tremendous impacts and results from. So even beyond that, just the mental health disorders, we're finding that these are very profound, remarkable in the, in various neurological disorders as well. So I think we're going to find as we move along in this journey, there's going to be a lot more uh, applications that are uh, more widespread than we initially think. And and again, these are these have been debilitating. Uh, issues and challenges that we've had no solutions to for for decades, and uh, I really hold this in great promise. And and certainly, again, to your point, we, we look to be on the forefront of uh, uh, of delivering these to uh, mm. you know many people, uh, giving them relief. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. I mean, like I'm in recovery as well. Like I've been, I'm a, I'm an addictive personality for sure, um, and like. I know I've been in, uh, you know, NA and AA and these programs for like, uh, for like, I don't know, six, seven years now. <clears throat> Most people don't make it out, right. you know, like in the sense of like, you don't go there and you're cool, you know, like you go there and then you fuck up a lot afterwards, <laughs> right. you know? Um, and so if you, if there is a way, cause I don't actually believe that they, they work some of the time, they don't work most of the time, you know, and that's not a good uh, statistic when you're dealing with, I mean, it's so prevalent. It's another thing. You know what I mean? That's not necessarily. It is mental health, uh, yeah. but there's. But it's from a treatment perspective. There's another unknown there, isn't there? Um, so if you guys do, if you guys can, like pick me, I'm there. I'm yeah. <laughs> good, good. We, we'll pick me, dude. Point. I'm ready. I'm ready. We're calling your number. <laughs> Cool, buddy. Well, look, it's been a privilege having you here. Um, and uh, when you do have those results of those trials back from Australia, let me know. Let's get you back on um, and let's keep this conversation going, okay? Wonderful. Thanks again for the time today, Matt. I really appreciate it. And and uh, again, you know, the audience can, um, you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, we are on, uh, you know, all the social media sites, you know, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Facebook, and, and all those social media outlets. And, you know, if people have questions, or you just want to you know, know more, or you know, if somebody is really suffering, you know, have them reach out and I'd love to guide and direct them. Um, you know, this is a passion and a mission for us. So, you know, we're, we're willing to help out and direct people to to we you know to other treatments that we know are available uh, for individuals. So awesome. Thanks everybody. Chad, it's been a privilege. Thank you so much, Matt. Ciao.